good afternoon, everybody. Um, uh, welcome to this webinar, which is part of the uh, Think Wider webinar series on, uh, on domestic um, uh, revenue mobilization. And today, uh, the, the actual topic of our webinar uh, is on, 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 on harnessing big data and ICT to boost revenues. Uh, my name is Jukka Birtila. I'm a professor of public economics at the University of Helsinki and Watt Institute for Economic Research in Helsinki, Finland. And I also serve as, uh, as a non-resident researcher uh, with UNU Wider. And I work with colleagues there on, on, on matters related to taxation, uh, especially in, in, in many African countries. So, uh, so the webinar is, is related to, uh, to the union wider work, research work uh, uh, that we carry out uh, um, pretty much using data uh, from, uh, uh, from administrative sources, uh, namely uh, uh, revenue authorities in African countries. So uh, we do this together with um, our colleagues. Um, so they can come from um, research organizations and they uh, are, are also coming from, uh, from these revenue authorities in African countries. So uh, we, we have research activities ongoing uh, with uh, uh, Uganda Revenue Authority, uh, Rwanda Revenue Authority, Tanzania Revenue Authority and Zambia Revenue. And in addition, uh, Union Wider works together with the uh, South Africans on, 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 on research re related to, uh, to, to South African uh, economic developments, also on the basis of tax administrative data. And really what we use the data for is for, for an analysis of um, enforcement and compliance. How can we increase revenues? And, and second, on, on looking at the implications of taxation on, on taxpayer behavior in terms of employment levels, investments, etc. And then also, also, I mean, this is something that Amina may touch upon, is that the uh, tax data is also useful for, um, for looking at various other things because it provides information about all formal sector income earners and, and firms. So, um, and one, let me mention one, one more thing. So one uh, stakeholder um, and, and, and contact in, in our work is also uh, the uh, uh, people who do technical assistance work, co uh, collaboration with the revenue authorities more from the, uh, from the practical side. Uh, so this includes, for example, the Finnish and the Norwegian tax authorities who have engagements in, in Africa. So I'm very pleased that uh, to get to today in the panel, we have representatives from, from all these uh, stakeholders. Uh, so uh, we, will be, we will be starting uh, with a presentation by my colleague Amina Ibrahim. Uh, Dr. Ibrahim is a research fellow at Union Wider and is the, is the lead for, for, for this research uh, that we do. And we are also joined with uh, 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 Julia Maskakni and Dr. Maskakni is the uh, research director at the International Center for Tax and Development uh, in, in the UK. And we have been um, uh, uh, doing joint work with, with Julia uh, for, 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 for some time now. And we are very pleased that, that you were able to join. Uh, uh, our second panelist is uh, Alan Nasanga, who is the assistant commissioner for research and innovations at Uganda Revenue Authority. And, uh, and we have been working together with Alan and her colleagues for, for many years uh, in, in, in researching these, these areas. And finally, we have uh, uh, Mr. Timo Laukkanen uh, from the Finnish Tax Administration, where he serves as the director of the Strategy Realization Office. And with Timo, we have been uh, talking and uh, doing work on, on, on uh, on uh, technical assistance and developing uh, tax enforcement uh, jointly. So, uh, as I said, we will be starting with the, uh, the, with the presentation by Amina, and then the panel will follow. Uh, uh, people in the audience, uh, 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 you are uh, now, uh, you can always, or already during the panel, um, uh, think about questions to 
Amina or any of the panelists, you can write them into the chat. And then in the Q&A after, the, uh, after the panel, uh, I can raise some of the questions from the, from the chat uh, to be discussed um, by the panel. Or then you can, after the panel, you can also raise your hand and, and then you can just unmute yourself and I, and I ask you and you can, you can yourself then uh, place the question to the panelists. I think um, um, that's more or less everything from my side. Uh, so Amina, please now, uh, uh, the, the floor is yours. Thanks, Jukka. So I'm going to start with uh, evidence-based policy making and apply it to our thinking uh, at revenue authorities and data and uh, harnessing uh, big data. Um, so I don't want to start with is really thinking about revenue authorities, what their job is, um, and the challenges around that. Um, so revenue authorities have this challenging task of raising revenues to fund public spending. And in order to do this, revenue authorities might want to know whether uh, increasing the tax rate or enhancing compliance helps them to raise revenues or whether a combination of both uh, gets them to their revenue targets. Now, in order to answer these questions, revenue authorities uh, need evidence to decide on what works best. Uh, and good evidence helps to create good policy. And in order to do so, revenue authorities require good data. And in this little uh, diagram I've got, uh, good data is actually one of the crucial components to evidence-based policy making. And with data and some variation, revenue authorities can produce some much needed evidence actually to improve policy. And the cycle continues when new policies are made or policies are changed. Uh, this creates a new source of variation and ongoing and continuous data collection can actually assist in creating new evidence that then again informs policy, whether it be new policy or updating policies or improving policies. How does this apply to taxation in the African context? Well, many African countries already collect taxpayer information uh, and they do so on a regular basis in order to calculate taxpayer liability. So you can think about uh, collecting uh, personal income taxes on an annual basis. You can think about VAT collections on a monthly or quarterly basis. Um, and in recent years, taxpayer information has moved from paper-based uh, collections to a digital format. Uh, and this has come with the onset of e-filing for taxpayers. Uh, and in some countries, uh, the use of electronic fiscal devices provides uh, transaction level data um, captured in real time um, to be used by the revenue authorities. But ICT and using ICT is not really a new phenomenon for revenue authorities. Um, They've been using taxpayer information to assess, for example, the riskiness of taxpayers uh, and think about um, who they should audit and using this measure of riskiness to determine uh, who they should audit. And what we've seen in recent years um, it goes a little bit beyond this, um, where revenue authorities are actually now using their administrative data to conduct research uh, to answer various questions about compliance and on ways in which to raise revenues. Um, so I'm going to provide three um, snapshots and examples of um, research concerned with raising revenues and compliance, uh, actually using tax data in three of the countries that we work in. The first example is from Tanzania. Uh, so the Tanzanian Revenue Authority worked with the Finnish Re Tax Administration to develop, to develop an Excel sheet uh, that was used to identify taxpayers to be examined. So previously, taxpayers were selected for examination by tax officers. And so this is an example of using ICT to make an, a risk assessment of a taxpayer coming to the tax office. The pilot study was run in the Dar es Salaam region and tax officers were trained on how to use the Excel sheet appropriately when tax, taxpayers came into the tax office. Um, and 
so what the outcome of the study actually finds that this risk-based tax examination led to some moderate increase uh, in additional reported income. And this really means uh, additional revenue for, for the revenue authority. Now we know from other studies that it's, it's not straightforward, not all risk-based selection automatically improve outcomes. Um, and sometimes we see some immediate effect and uh, over time the effect uh, dissipates. Uh, in this case, uh, we know the results hold immediately, but we're not sure maybe for one or two years after how the examination um, has, has panned out. Um, and so more, more research is actually required in this area given some of the sort of mixed, uh, mixed results. The second case uh, is from Zambia. So in 2017, the Zambian Revenue Authority introduced a withholding VAT mechanism. Uh, this mechanism meant that some VAT agents would withhold and remit the full VAT to the revenue authority. And this change was based on this understanding that withholding is an approach to improve tax compliance. So the research study tries to assess the impact of introducing this withholding VAT agents uh, on firm reporting decisions and on tax revenue. Uh, and what's, what's transpired is that the da data compiled by these uh, withholding VAT agents actually serves as a check uh, to prevent false claims. And the paper trail that's been left behind or generated by this withholding VAT agents uh, have also compelled suppliers to file their returns. Um, and because these, uh, these records are now, or these claims are filed electronically, the Revenue Authority has been able to more easily verify the claims. The study is ongoing, but the early results show that the reported sales and value added tax increase for uh, withholding VAT agents after the reform, and then there's, that there's actually also been an improved uh, VAT compliance due to this change in the reporting mechanism. The third example is from Uganda. So in 2015, the Ugandan Revenue Authority introduced a new electronic system of e-filing for presumptive tax, uh, which simplified the filing uh, of small businesses. So this is an example of a change in the technology to capture the taxes of small businesses. Uh, the small picture on the right is, uh, is a snapshot of the e-filing uh, form that taxpayers could use on the URA website. Uh, so this was uh, an additional, a new way for small businesses to, to file their taxes. Um, and while some, that, some are still um, using Excel sheets, um, the, the take up was quite high. Um, and the study shows that the change led to an increase in the number of tax filers, although some simply report the minimum income, but that the intervention also helped to raise revenues in a small way. So these are three, Three examples, um, you know, from research that we've done um, to demonstrate how ICT can be used to raise revenues, and, and all of these have been uh, conducted in collaboration with the revenue authorities using tax administrative data. Now, harnessing um, harnessing big data um, is not uh, the easiest task, and um, Many revenue authorities have gone through this process of tax modernization. Uh, and one outcome of this process is, we think is about data accessibility. So with the modernization process, data and, uh, are collected and are stored in an organized manner. Uh, electronic filing and further use of ICT also means that information about taxpayers are more easily collected. So e-filing can also mean that the data collected are more complete, uh, taxpayers have less chance of skipping fields on the tax form uh, where they are mandatory uh, and fields could even be automatically populated with information provided uh, previously to the revenue authority or from other sources. As revenue authorities introduce electronic collection of VAT, corporate income taxes or personal income taxes with a single taxpayer identification uh, number, uh, tax authorities can actually view these various or can link these various uh, tax submissions. Regular collection or regular electronic collection also means that uh, you can now see how tax collection changes over time um, and it responds to certain policies. 
Uh, and the data collected can be used to evaluate the effectiveness of these policy changes. And so now we're back to the cycle of evidence-based policy making that I spoke about at the, or I started off with. Um, so in a unique collaboration with revenue authorities uh, in Uganda and South Africa, anonymized tax data are now being accessed by researchers in a secure way. And the data available uh, can further research on improving tax collection. But as you mentioned in the opening, um, the data can also be used to shed light on other areas of the economy where data is actually quite scarce. As always, uh, ICT can help improve data collection um, and uh, revenue collection, but it isn't perfect and there are few, few ways that this can still be improved. Uh, data cross checks and third party uh, information are important, um, also for improving tax compliance and helping to verify the data collected. Uh, more data could be used then again to train risk engines and identify uh, risky taxpayers. Um, and as technology improves, there are technical fixes to ICT systems um, that weren't available before. Um, and you can even think about more accurate information sort of on uh, the idea that comes to mind or example comes to mind is a location field. So previously, you know, if they could think about something that was manually collected, that um, was hard to read, uh, then we moved to something that was collected and people typed in their address, but they made errors in um, typing the street name or the area. And now with some of these fields can automatically or pre-populate as you're typing. Um, and so that's just an example that comes to mind. Um, but uh, importantly, uh, harnessing big data actually requires technical capacity, and this means upskilling staff already in revenue authorities um, and looking to areas uh, such as data science uh, for lessons on how to improve data uh, collection and capture and processing, um, in particular, now I'm thinking about for research. Where does this leave us? The core function of the revenue authority uh, remains to raise revenue and much of the work that revenue authorities are doing relates to finding ICT solutions to help uh, them collect this revenue. Um, and so now I've given three examples of how ICT has assisted revenue authorities in the process of revenue collection um, and actually how we've used data from revenue authorities to enable these uh, evaluation. Um, so, the last thing I want to say is this research presented in a co collaboration, our collaboration with revenue authorities is actually part of SDG 17, where the goal is to build capacity and support revenue authorities in finding ways to raise revenue. Thanks. Thank you so much, Amina, uh, for setting the scene so nicely and also uh, uh, for outlining uh, some of the, the, the future directions that uh, this, this sort of work uh, should be going. Um, okay, so uh, now we can move on uh, to the discussion uh, by the panelists. Um, uh, maybe, I mean, if you, yes, thank you. So just a reminder for those who are, who are joining a little, maybe a little bit late. Uh, so we just heard from, um, uh, I mean, Abraham, who's, the who's a research fellow at Union Wider. And now we move on to the, to the policy panel discussion. And the panel consists of uh, Julia Maskakni, a research director at the Inst uh, International Center of Tax and Development uh, in, in the UK. Uh, Alan Nasanga, uh, um, assistant commissioner uh, from the Uganda Revenue Authority. And uh, Timo Laukaren, who's uh, uh, a director at the Finnish Tax Administration. Uh, and I just also want to uh, remind everybody that the, um, um, uh, you may already know um, if you have uh, feedback questions uh, to Amina or any of the panelists, uh, please feel free to use the chat uh, for, 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 uh, uh, for writing the, uh, the, your, your feedback or comment. Okay, so moving on uh, to the panel. So let us start uh, with Julia. Um, uh, Julia, um, can you start kick off by by by, by sharing some of the some of your uh, experiences and working as a researcher? 
using ad administrative tax data and, the, um, and looking at the ICT solutions. Sure, happy to happy to do that. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Yuka, for the invitation and uh, for uh, considering me to be part of this excellent uh, panel of speakers. Uh, I think I will just uh, take um, my comments will just follow quite neatly from Amina's presentation because she already um, said very clearly um, how ICTD and big data can be. Um, really important for tax administration. She detailed examples from Tanzania, Zambia, Uganda. Um, so I think I want to follow up directly from that um, and, and talk a little bit about the practice and how those things then, uh, what we learn from, from, uh, from research on, on how these things pan out in practice. Um, and of course, the research that we have on these uh, big digitized data sets and, um, and IT solutions is that they are often not used to the full potential in the reality of tax administration in, in lower income countries. Um, and Amina touched upon uh, this a little bit as well in her presentation. And I know this comes up from research not only done by myself, but also by my colleagues at ICTD. Fabrizio Santoro is now uh, online. Saeed Iman is also online from the ICTD. But also your research from wider uh, shows that, uh, that quite clearly. In my own experience analyzing administrative data from Ethiopia and Rwanda, what I've seen is that uh, in the data that, uh, that is already available, there are often quite a few discrepancies. Um, so for example, the same taxpayer reports a different turnover um, in their income tax declaration as compared to their VAT tax declaration for the same period without there being any obvious explanation for that. Uh, that was uh, a result that we got from Ethiopia. But also similarly, we have done some work with the administrative data from Rwanda uh, with my colleague Fabrizio Santoro and Denis Mukama from the Rwanda Revenue Authority. And there we have found that those electronic fiscal de devices capturing all the sales uh, in, in real time, they often produce data that is actually not consistent with what is in taxpayers tax declarations for the same period for the same taxpayer. And I could give you a few more examples like that. Um, so it's it's clear that those things are uh, are are not yet fully fully exploited in practice. I think um, one of the lessons for me is that it's definitely not possible to um, to parachute data, digitized data, digitization, and uh, IT solutions into tax administration and expect them to transform tax administration by themselves. In many ways, data and IT solutions are very much part of a system, and that system has many different parts. Uh, and um, and I'm sure uh, Alan and Timo will will uh, speak to that a little bit. But you know, all the traditional functions of revenue authorities, taxpayer services, enforcement, audit departments, and so on. Um, technology and data need to work and interact with those traditional functions in in way that um, that allow for for their potential to be uh, to be tapped. And uh, some of these, some of these things uh, again come from research. Um, so there is some research, for example, from Ecuador, but also from other countries, showing that using third-party information is not necessarily helpful to convince taxpayers to comply if there is no capacity to actually follow up with uh, with traditional enforcement. Mm -hmm. um, and similarly, the communication infrastructure uh, that we now have with the uh, SMS or um, or emails, and I've done some research uh, on that as well in, in Rwanda, uh, as you know, uh, is, has its own limitations if it cannot be paired up with the, with actual enforcement. So imagine you receive these messages from the tax authority about uh, you know sanctions and audits and uh, you know your data is uh, contains discrepancies, but actually nothing happens after that in terms of real enforcement or real interaction. So not only these things can lose effectiveness when they're not working in tandem with traditional functions, but they can also potentially affect the credibility of the institution itself. Um, so the reality of uh, tax administration needs to be um, considered quite carefully. And I could give you other examples uh, around, you know, information, sensitization, education campaigns. And there's huge potential for technology to help these things. But then again, that needs to match the experience of taxpayers as they go through the tax paying process and as they interact with taxpayer services and um, uh, call centers and so on. So in many ways, for me, one of the lessons is that um, IT solutions and data 
to a certain extent are only as good as the rest of the functions they're supposed to support. Um, they can, of course, help to improve those functions within revenue administrations, but they certainly cannot replace them. They need to work in tandem. And one can make very similar considerations about taxpayers, because this, what I just said, was very much focused on tax administrations. But when you look at uh, taxpayers as well, uh, digitized data, um, electronic fiscal devices could actually be very helpful for taxpayers uh, to help improve the transparency of their records, even give them some form of record that is already digitized um, by design. But of course, depending on the type of taxpayers and their level of engagement with the digital world in general, uh, these things might end up being uh, useful or, or not useful to them, actually, depending on their reality. So for some taxpayers, these IT solutions are premature. Um, and if that is the, the, if that is the case, um, they might even come with additional compliance costs. So in many ways, instead of helping, they might actually represent more of a burden, especially for those small taxpayers uh, that might not have the necessary equipment or knowledge or, um, or skills to make them work properly. And again, we do have a fair bit of research on these things. Uh, some of it is specific to uh, data and technology. Some of it is more general um, about tax administration and tax compliance in low-income countries. But making sure that these things uh, work together is uh, shouldn't really get our hopes uh, down on on the on the potential for um, uh, for tax and uh, for data and technology, but. Um, should really give us sort of guide us in the way that these things can be harnessed to their full potential. Um, there's a lot more that I could uh, talk about, but I've been told that I have about seven minutes. So I think I'm, uh, I'm about, uh, I'm about uh, up to my time. So I'll, I'll leave it there for now. Thank you, Julia. That was perfect. And uh, it was nice you were able to connect, I mean, your work on the um, on voluntary compliance and, and, and nudging the voluntary compliance and then uh, the necessity to also to follow up from the point of view of the tax administration in terms of then the sort of a harder real enforcement as well. I'm, I'm wondering, uh, uh, I mean, if you stop sharing the screen, can we see the panelists, you know, as, as a bigger, bigger on that screen? Um, you still? Yes, thank you. Okay, so now, um, uh, now we can see uh, uh, more easily. Okay, thank you, Julia, once more. Uh, uh, and uh, maybe we move on then, then to um, uh, uh, to hear from Alan. Uh, and and Alan, can you can you share your experiences on on how uh, a revenue authority can actually utilize research and and how do you connect then the uh, uh, information communications technology and, and and research? Alan, please. Thank you so much, Hugo and team. Thank you for the invite. Yes, um, picking on from uh, first, um, Julia. Um, yes, um, in a way, um, technology enables um, the authorities to have visibility into who the taxpayers are and so can help us manage their compliance better. Yes, it's true that um, the taxpayers are different levels of uh, use of ICT, but um, there are those taxpayers who, once they know that uh, the authority is aware, the authority knows that I transacted with so-and-so, the authority has all the data, then uh, they automatically come in and comply. However, uh, we, are, um, we have different uh, levels of use of ICT, for example, in the country. There are those persons who are very conversant with use of ICT, but there are also those, the small and medium, who um, still need, as an authority, we need to sensitize them, we need to handhold them into using many of the platforms we put out. Yes, so you have a point in there. It is helpful, but uh, because of uh, um, the way um, our dynamics, uh, use of ICT is in the country, um, even things like um, internet um, internet coverage, the speeds, the bandwidth is the way, because of the, some of those factors, um, they are not all at the same level. But notwithstanding, technology is key and is helping us a lot um, as a Uganda Revenue Authority, for example. We, um, some time back, we developed um, an enterprise um, data warehouse. And what this is, we just pick data from um, different transaction systems. 
within our authority and integrate it to create like a profile about a taxpayer. Then on top of this data, we, we developed a risk engine, which be using particular risk parameters. We generate risk scores as well as um, financial importance scores for particular taxpayers. Then as an authority, these um, help us uh, focus our compliance actions specific to taxpayers where we're going to get uh, slightly more uh, revenue as well as those who are risky. As you can uh, imagine, we are, we are now about 3,000 people uh, in Uganda Revenue Authority and the taxpayer population is so big. So we use ICT and data analytics really to help us uh, target our efforts to know which taxpayer should we go to, which area, where should we uh, deploy more. But uh, as you said, uh, Julia, we we use um, the use of ICT is not detached from um, the other measures. We still have um, uh, enforcement measures and compliance measures that need to move uh, hand in hand. Nonetheless, ICT is very important. And uh, without our data, there's very little we can do. For example, it's hard to know who is not registered. We have um, sometimes initiatives in um, uh, like uh, the, the downtown uh, where they are um, I don't know how to describe downtown to you, but there are many small businesses going on. We, we have um, some initiatives um, that uh, people go walk in there and try and find who is not registered. But uh, over time, we've realized that uh, those are not as effective as comparing, for example, pulling uh, the local authority data and mapping it against our register to identify who is missing. Uh, partnerships where we, we, we collaborate with data, we pick, uh, we have local authorities like uh, Camp city council authorities, Kampala city council authority, they also register the small businesses and give them trading licenses. So uh, through a partnership, we, we work with them and ask them to have uh, our tax identification as part of the certificate. So we map their data set to our data warehouse. And that in um, a small, um, is more efficient, for example, in finding who is known to now register. Also, in terms of uh, who is known to uh, complying, who is not paying exactly what they are supposed to do, these are data initiatives of uh, mapping our data set to another organization data set goes a long way in facilitating us as an authority. It's interesting, but uh, it's, it's possible. We have the National Social Security Fund. People uh, make submissions there based on their income. And uh, it's possible that they submit differently to the social security fund as um, compared to what they submit to URA. So um, a mapping of our data here and there uh, uh, with the national social security and URA, we are able to identify particular gaps. Um, also, uh, you, uh, uh, it's interesting within the URA, we have different tax types as you're aware, um, income taxes and we have VAT. It's possible um, that sometimes somebody declares a different amount in VAT and a different amount in uh, income tax. So using the, our tools, our technology, our eHub, mapping these different data sets enables us realize the gaps and so which taxpayer to engage and rank them uh, based on uh, who is not exactly very truthful within their declaration. This has really helped us a long way in uh, trying to drive compliance. We also use the data from um, um, the custom side. We manage um, the, the imports and exports, mapping uh, the imports and exports to what a particular person has declared also goes a long way in helping us. But yes, the taxpayer community out there is not, not everyone um, is abreast with use of technology. Uh, we are, they are not at the same level. So partly as an authority, our role is then um, to sensitize, to handhold them, to show them the importance of this technology and um, there are also cases where um, the authority and government has gone ahead to um, like uh, maybe subsidize some of uh, uh, the requirements for them to uptake the technology because um, you find like um, uh, we introduced a digital um, tax stamps but um, at the beginning the stamps needed to be free of charge for people to take them up we also have now um, on board uh, um, an electronic uh, 
uh, IFRIS system, but um, the, the government had um, looking for the gadgets for all the small persons to be able to comply to use the technology. Um, uh, the taxpayers, the small and medium people would complain about the cost. So again, we have to come in and find a way of getting them um, to use the technology without incurring a cost. Yes, uh, Julia, you're very uh, right. There's a cost to technology, which uh, probably um, we, we still need to, to handle this particular challenge, either through um, subsidizing for the small and medium um, in the short run as uh, they, sh they uh, realize the benefits of use of technology. But as an authority, technology is the way to go. We really can't go back from use of technology and specifically uh, using data. The data matching here and there helps us a lot. It's interesting, but uh, the same company can submit different uh, declarations for one tax type and the other, and they are all submitted to you. And um, uh, on the face, it's possible to imagine that um, the officers, the URA staff can easily map them. But uh, because of uh, the number of staff vis-a-vis -vis the number, the population, it's not possible in um, a short while to map them. But through technology, we can easily match this data and sieve out who who is not compliant, who has not, uh, there uh, in, the, in our system, people make a declaration first. When you make a declaration, you're, you, you're declaring how your business has performed. Then after that, uh, you come in with a payment. It's possible that I make a declaration and then I pay much less than what I declared. And all these uh, is technology that is helping us uh, bridge the gaps. Want to know who hasn't declared, who is not on the register. Apart from uh, those who have declared, have they really paid everything they've declared? All those um, little gaps are really, um, we manage them through use of our data, through use of our data warehouse. And uh, of course, uh, through um, through um, sensitizing the, the public out there. We, we try and say that if you comply, if you let us know, we can go into arrangements like um, installment payments, et cetera. But if you stay out there and um, you, you wait for us to find you, uh, uh, to enforce on you, then uh, it will be more expensive on you. And true, when the taxpayers are aware that uh, the authority will discover me, if they know that uh, it's a matter of time, URA will discover that I have not paid this amount or URA will discover that um, my submissions are not uh, very truthful, then they will comply. So in a way, um, that way, technology is really at the forefront in URA and it's really helping us uh, manage risk, manage compliance, as well as grow our register by mapping to the different local authorities that are also registering the same taxpayers. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ale. That um, all sounds um, very, very impressive, and, uh, and indeed, I mean, um, we are we are at the moment as we speak also. I mean, trying to um, look at the, some of the longer term impacts of of investment in technology in uh, in looking at, for example, the uh, the revenue impacts of tax audits in Uganda. Uh, all right. Uh, now. Uh, uh, let us move on to the to the to the next panelist, um, who's, who's Timo. Uh, Timo, you have worked um, uh, from the from the point of view of a, of a revenue authority in the global north. So um, please share about your experiences um, in uh, in working together uh, together with the, uh, uh, revenue authorities in the developing countries and what role uh, technical assistance can play there. Over to you, Timo. Thank you, and, and nice to be with you here. Um, I've actually got three points on 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 um, data and and revenue authorities, and and I think the first point really came clearly up in in Amina's presentation and also Julius and Alan's points. So, looking into the not so big data and 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 seeing what's actually in front of your eyes. So tax administrations really have lots of data available and 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 it's good to look if you're if you're really doing enough with that data uh, there's a bit of an echo okay i'll try again um so and after that when you've looked what data you already have so understanding 
which data is actually needed after that and trying to get better access to, to the data that is needed. So third party information, other government agencies, private stakeholders and, and taking use and sharing that data. Um, sometimes it's a legislation issue. So, so trying to influence the legislation if, if that poses an issue. Um, my second point is, is about customer and, and ecosystem understanding. So, so using the data to actually understand your customers or, or taxpayers, if you, if you will. So both sides of the, of the story, so to say, so that the risks related to them and their behavior, but also the service needs and, and possibilities to, to tap into the natural processes of your, of your customers. So, um, based on on the understanding then trying to make it easy for the customers to comply and hard not to so so incorporating taxation into the natural processes of companies or individuals whenever that's possible and 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 aiming towards compliance by design where the customers actually cannot choose whether to pay their taxes or not or at least they have to make conscious decisions and actions not to pay them split payment for VAT would be an example where taxes are transferred to tax administration immediately when the transaction occurs. So these kind of changes in the paradigm require understanding of the whole ecosystem around the citizens and companies, not just thinking about the taxation, but all the stakeholders in the ecosystem. And, and it requires active cooperation with, with public and private parties. And, and I'd recommend looking at the OECD's Tax Administration 3.0 that provides useful outlines for this progress and the, and the maturity model that is linked to, uh, to the models that, that's a way to actually evaluate your current state and next steps. If that seems uh, too far ahead uh, in, in the future, so my, my third point is, is more about that the basic systems and processes in, in place and, and, and Julia mentioned the basic capacities needed. So uh, all the data in the world is not going to help you if you don't have the capability to process it. Uh, first of all, um, the analytical capability to make information, knowledge and wisdom out of the data. So for example, finding the risky customers or transactions and the best suited measures to deal with them but also the capability to use the data as part of the taxation processes. So uh, data and analytics need to feed into the taxation processes to actually improve compliance and increase revenue. So this might require new systems that are capable of higher interoperability. Siloed legacy systems are sometimes a problem, might not suffi sufficiently support this. And, and, and sometimes tax administrations lack the needed in-house capacity to, to build the needed integrated systems from scratch. So uh, sometimes the best solution might be to look at what's available in the market because um, there are ready-made commercial off-the-shelf integrated taxation systems out there. But in addition to the systems, it, it usually also requires redesigning the business processes to to, to best take advantage of the data. And, and Julia touched upon this as well. So if you just bring in new data, the processes might suffocate and, and struggle to understand the new data and what to do with it, or simply ignore the new data and continue as before. And, and, and this better data, uh, new business processes also require new skills from the officers uh, and, and citizens. Uh, which in turn requires training and much more, like like Alan mentioned, the hand-holding part. So even the best systems and the most wisely designed processes fail if people don't know what to do or don't want to act in a, in a new way. So change management is, is, an, is essential to any success. And it, it might mean much more than just training. People need to understand the reasons for changes and, and what's in it for them. And, and they need constant support. Um, the one example that, that Amina mentioned of what we've done together with Tanzania Revenue Authority and, and UNU wider. So um, like the basic principle in, in technical assistance and capacity building is that you do no harm, uh, which is why we wanted to measure the effect of our intervention. So not just how many meetings or trainings we've had or, or measuring something that we don't really have influence on. So. We designed a, a new pilot process for tax control for, for examination in, in Tanzania and, and also the support model to ensure the change. So it was a bit more 
um, than, than uh, just an Excel sheet and, and risk profiling. Uh, it did include the risk profiling, but, but also um, it started from the new instructions to officers and, uh, and a, a totally new process flow. So, and, and, and with the help of the uh, UNU wider team, then we were able to, to measure the outcomes of the, of the new process and the effects on revenue. Um, this kind of um, work has created lots of interest in, in also other tax administrations doing capacity building since measuring the outcomes is, is difficult and, and usually uh, it's, it's not done. Or it, it, people are not able to, to do that. So, so the point here is, is to also get data about your processes and, and their outcomes so you can make wiser decisions. So three points looking into the not so big data, uh, getting customer and ecosystem understanding and, and uh, having your basic systems and processes in place. Thank you. Great. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you so much, Timo. Um, uh, so indeed, so this requires quite a thorough change sometimes. I mean, it's not, all, it's not always enough to, I mean, uh, to have the technical capacity. Somehow the organization also needs to be functional and, 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 and be available to benefit, benefit from, the, from the improvements. Uh, thank you once again for all panelists. Um, um, is there among the panelists or Amina uh, any additional thoughts that um, has not, uh, may have now uh, uh, come up when you listen to the other panelists? before we move on to the Q&A. No direct need for intervention at this point. So uh, everybody happy, uh, so far so good. Excellent. And uh, so uh, uh, we have some questions from the audience. We have, uh, um, do we still have uh, um, Mr. Kwame uh, from Togo present? Are you online still? Would you like to ask your questions, unmute yourself and ask your question? Okay, thank you. Uh, my question is to um, Amina. Uh, I want to know the, how the, the regulation framework on the privacy, uh, as we are talking about data, you know that when you collect data from someone can use it, uh, maybe not to the, the, the objective you do declare uh, at first. So how is the regulation going and uh, how people or uh, firms can be uh, confident uh, to use uh, ICT to boost uh, uh, revenue uh, collection? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's an excellent point and uh, needs to be addressed. Uh, Amina, would you like to take that question? Sure. Um, I, I mean, I think that's a really important point, um, and thank you for raising it. Um, so my first comment would be that actually it's not the same in every country. So every country has their own uh, set of data regulation and protection laws, um, and in each country that we work with, we we work with the local partners that then inform us on what the regulation is and, and how um, how to interact with that. Um, I think our model specifically in terms of research um, and when we work with revenue authorities is to make sure that we, we work with anonymized data. Um, and the point really for research is not to identify individual taxpayers. Um, it doesn't benefit us uh, in any way. Um, we end up looking at sort of more aggregate uh, estimates of, of what's going on. Um, so, you know, so anonymization being the basic um, methodology, um, some tax authorities, revenue authorities, uh, ensure that data is only accessed in a specific way. Um, so it's never accessed online. Uh, some revenue authorities require uh, to sign uh, non-disclosure agreements and oaths of secrecy. Uh, so there's several ways um, that they ensure that taxpayer identification is is not, uh, you know, is not leaked uh, in the research process. Um, and even then, you know, once all the research is done, often the results are checked um, to make sure that even by mistake, um, you know, nobody's been identified. Um, 
And so, I, I mean, I think that's an important part um, of the process. And I think uh, it's taken some time to get there. Uh, it's not, um, there are lots of um, ways in which revenue authorities also need to uh, understand and respect that there is, um, this is, some of it is personal information um, and not uh, share those specific things um, so widely. Yes, thank you, Amina. Um, so there was actually, um, I see that the, in, the, in, the, uh, in one of the messages, I mean, uh, uh, our colleague from SARS, the South Africa Revenue Service, Lillian, uh, asks how, um, what are the implications of all this for um, uh, sharing, sharing information across government institutions? Uh, so uh, maybe, I mean, Amina, can you perhaps start commenting on that and and um, and also maybe Alan on on how do you see the information flow between uh, the various uh, parts of the government and 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 are there risks there as well from the from the from the uh, privacy uh, point of view? Uh, maybe we we can take a page out of the the book from the Nordics um, on how this this is collected. So um, <laughs> the. I think, I mean, I think it takes a lot of effort to to start working between um, different departments um, and managing to get data. So um, you find that uh, different departments collect different data in different ways, uh, and then they anonymize data in different ways. And so then it becomes very difficult to actually put those data sets together. Um, and at the minimum, I think there should be a conversation about how they could be done. Um, and there are some efforts, at least I know in South Africa, um, where you know you work with the Department of Labor to look at unemployment insurance insurance fund information, where identification numbers can be anonymized in the same way and starting to match in into the data. Um, but to go back to Kwame's point about the more data you start adding together, um, maybe the, the increased uh, level of sensitivity of the data. And so you need to think quite hard about what are the regulations and how you want to maintain, maintain some security um, around the data where possible. Uh, I, I, Ellen, do you have any other thoughts? Yeah, um, thank you so much. Um, uh, it would just be sharing our case study in Uganda. Um, there are efforts as government to share data, but uh, they are not moving as fast as uh, we would have loved. Simply because um, as government, we are at different levels of uh, automation. Some government areas are so advanced and others are slightly lagging behind. We currently share data for purposes of um, completing a single transaction. For example, within the URA, we have um, um, a new way uh, of registering taxpayers and they get their TIN instantly. And this we do by sharing uh, data with a registration authority, with a person's registration authority called um, National, it's NIRA, it's called NIRA in Uganda. Um, now, what happens is that uh, when a, a taxpayer comes to register as an individual, we just just um, ask them for their national registration ID number. And then now uh, when we pick that ID number, we already just confirm their details from the other agency. And then we can issue them uh, a registration, a TIN registration very fast. But um, in, in terms of uh, sharing data for analysis purposes, as in you give us uh, your database and we map on our database, um, that happens on a case by case, and we, we still go, have to go through issues of then we sign an MOU, we have the same regulation for data protection, but um, still every uh, agency, if I may say, is more of, uh, we, is still inward looking, they collect data for only thinking about only their purpose and then when it comes to sharing we still um although we are all government then we say you need to sign the mou because of data protection and yeah you would imagine that we should just share together so um there's still progress but i must say it's a bit slow um mm. thank you so much thank you this this may sound like a technicality of sharing data between various arms of the government but in fact, it's related to one of the, I mean, core messages in, in, in tax administrative administration research, which is that the, I mean, uh, the, uh, uh, the possibility to use third-party information regarding the taxpayer, and the, and the, and the more easily the, this sort of third-party information flows in, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, 
uh, the, uh, the the better uh, the tax administration will be, and and and, and it can keep also uh, tax uh, avoidance evasion at bay. Okay, so we still have some, luckily, some some time. This is a very short uh, webinar, only one hour, so that I'm, I'm certain that we could continue for uh, for quite quite some time. But I see um, uh, Laban has has raised his hand. Uh, Laban, are you are you following? And yes, you Yuka. Thank you. Thank yes. you, Yuka. Interesting uh, conversation from all the discussants. Very important points. But when you hear uh, from all of the presenters, all four of them, uh, you can see an underlying issue with uh, change. When the when uh, people uh, do not follow the technology change that's happening, uh, one is bound to face uh, problems, and that's what we're beginning to see in many tax authorities, uh, especially in our part of the world. So how can we ensure that the technological change we're seeking to make more efficient our tax administrations uh, is matched by adaptation in our skills? Uh, this point was raised earlier. Uh, technology is only as good as the skills it supports and the persons it supports, the processes it supports. Oftentimes there's been underinvestment in the other uh, mm -hmm. components of an effective or efficient tax system. Uh, much has been focused on investing in the technology and we're beginning to see the cost of that. Uh, so it, it's a question to provoke thinking, not necessarily an answer, but it's something we've seen, we've observed even here in Zambia, how to ensure that our staff, our taxpayers are carried along with the changes that are happening. Thank you, Yuka. Thank you. That's an excellent question, Laban. Um, maybe can you still um, come back and, and, and introduce yourself for those who don't know you? Thank you, Yuka. My name is Laban. I'm uh, from the Zambia Revenue Authority. I've been a project manager for a data analytics project. All of the discussion today is very le relevant to us, especially on that project. But I also work with researchers in the department, uh, statistics in general, and everything to do with tax, Yuka. <laughs> I hope I haven't <laughs> confused the presenters. Thank you. <laughs> like all of us, of course, yes. OK, so uh, uh, now back to the panelists. Um, uh, would you like to um, uh, um, perhaps respond to, to Laban? Uh, Julia? Uh, Anything from your side or, or for the other other things that we have now touched upon uh, before we close? Uh, I mean, I can I can uh, just make a couple of remarks that really pick up from what uh, Alan and Timo also said uh, before, which I found really, really interesting. And uh, one thing is, you know, how to bring citizens along. There's definitely a big role for sensitization and training and taxpayer education. And Alan has been talking about that. I know the URA is very active there and other revenue authorities as well. Um, these processes take time, uh, but I think that all that is very important um, to build skills, but also to build, uh, you know, uh, awareness of, of, the, of the importance of taxes more generally and, uh, and the approach to, to tax collection. And on the tax administration side, to build those skills on basic functions, um, but also uh, make sure that, uh, you know, this approach of customer orientation really filters through the whole organization down to the frontline workers who actually deal with taxpayers every day, um, because that is what taxpayers see um, on their on their side. Uh, they might not read the flagship reports, but they will see how tax officials they deal with um, uh, act. Uh, and I think doing that will help build, you know, the credibility of uh, tax administrations, which is already very high in many contexts, uh, and trust with the with citizens who ultimately need to want to comply because there's no way any revenue authority in any country can actually check every single taxpayer so that element of credibility and trust um, is is quite key in my view um, whether or not we speak about data and technology i think th those considerations are probably broader thank you thank you uh, julia once more and and, and still uh, maybe we have around 
time because we started a little bit late so we, maybe we have one one or two more extra minutes so that we can still hear from um, Alan and, 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 and Timo as well on on, on these new, newer questions. Alan over to you. Thank you so much. Um, the role of technology and data analytics can't be underestimated in um, a modern uh, revenue administration. Yes, um, there are challenges um, of uh, uh, skills, uh, the staff skills, as well as the citizenry. So um, change management uh, needs to, uh, is also key. We need to sensitize, we need to uh, upgrade the skills, handhold and help um, both staff and uh, the public take up the different uh, technologies. Um, of course, um, as um, the more data we use, um, third party information can all help us into uh, realizing um, any gaps within uh, maybe compliance or uh, risks, which uh, can then be closed. Um, yes, uh, the data um, uh, or the results of the data, the BI needs to be to fit into the work processes, the workflow. Um, so that, for example, where you do some analysis, it needs um, to go into the process, trigger some activity to a particular staff to take action. Um, and that way we can uh, improve as uh, revenue administrations. Thank you so much. Thank you once again. Uh, and Timo, any final thoughts? Yeah, yeah. But the managing the change part is, is one of my favorite topics. So I could go on a bit here, but um, <laughs> I'll, I'll keep it short. It's just like uh, take a systematic approach and, and recognize that it actually needs resources. Uh, it's, it's in an ICT project. So it's, it's the same thing as testing. You need people to do testing. You do need people to do change management. It's not something that you can do as, a, as an afterthought. It needs to be planned systematically and, and, and the actions need to be taken to, uh, to actually get something uh, done and, and ready. Thank you. That's an excellent point where we, where we, uh, where we now uh, need to end. So um, uh, unfortunately, I'm, our time is up. Uh, thank you once again so much, um, uh, all the panelists for joining. Thank you for, uh, for the audience, for, for the questions and, and following. Thank you, Amina, for the excellent presentation in the beginning. And, 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 and while we have all uh, the revenue authorities and researchers have uh, done a lot of um, advances in terms of using all these uh, new excitement de developments, there's quite a bit of still work ahead of us. So, uh, so stay tuned and, and follow up the union wider work in this um, area going forward as well. Thank you once again, and bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye.